Today, Linda McMahon and Chris Murphy face off in their first debate for the Senate seat to replace retiring Senator Joe Lieberman in the state of Connecticut. Morning to you. I'm Dennis House and welcome to the first debate in the race for the U.S. Senate seat currently held by the retiring Senator Joe Lieberman. We thank you for joining us. First, the rules. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to answer a question. And the candidate asked the question first will then have 30 seconds to rebut his or her opponent's after the answer to that question. Please welcome our panelists, Angela Dias from WTIC Radio, Mark Pazniokas from the Connecticut Mirror, and Fran Schneido from WCBS Radio. And now, let's bring out our candidates, Democrat Chris Murphy and Republican Linda McMahon. A coin toss determined that Mrs. McMahon will begin with a one-minute opening statement. Mrs. McMahon. Well, good morning, and thanks to Channel 3 and our panelists, and welcome to our studio audience, you know, and our, and our folks watching at home. You know, I'm often asked, well, why are you running for the United States Senate? And that answer is very simple. It's so that my six grandchildren and future generations will be guaranteed America's promise for prosperity. You know, that promise is rapidly slipping away because our economy is on the wrong track. 170,000 people woke up in our state this morning without a job. Now, we can get our economy back on track. We get our people back to work. I have a plan to do that. You know, I've been there. I've been bankrupt. I've lost everything, and I've been able to come back. And that's what we need to do. My opponent has no plan in the policies that he supported in Washington have only made things worse. Now, you have a very clear path. You can look at a path for someone who's created millions of jobs, or you can look at a path for someone who is going to push our economy off a fiscal cliff. Mrs. McMahon, thank you. Mr. Murphy. Well, thank you very much, Dennis, and thank you to Channel 3. I'm really looking forward to this morning. You know, I'm a product of Connecticut's middle class. My grandfather worked in the factories of New Britain. My uh, mother is a retired school teacher from Wethersfield. And I was raised to believe that I needed to live my life in a way to stand up for the middle class families of the state that's meant so much to my family. It's why in the state legislature I passed Connecticut's stem cell law, which is saving lives and putting people to work. It's why I went to Congress to stand up for manufacturing and fight outsourcing. That's me. That's my story, standing up for this state. It's a very different story than Linda McMahon's. Over and over again, Linda McMahon has shown that she stands up for herself and her profits at the expense of the people that work for and at the expense of this state. As your senator, I'm going to stand for only one thing, the middle class of this state. I look forward to the next hour. Mr. Murphy, thank you. Our first question from Angela Dias to Mr. Murphy. Both of you have had personal financial problems. Mr. Uh, Murphy, you have been sued for non-payment of mortgage bills. Mrs. McMahon, you filed for bankruptcy and walked away from debts. How can Connecticut voters feel confident that you're going to be able to exercise good judgment on federal budget decisions affecting Connecticut taxpayers when at times you've mismanaged your own personal finances? Well, I thank you for this question. You know, as I've said, I've made mistakes in my per personal finances. I'm not perfect, uh, but uh, I made those mistakes and I fixed them. Uh, the fact is that everybody that's looked into these allegations that Linda McMahon has been making in this campaign have said that they're completely false. Uh, everyone from the Hartford Current to the Connecticut Post, the Danbury News Times, uh, every independent financial expert. Um, and what makes a lot of these attack ads that we've seen from Linda McMahon um, especially troubling is the fact that during the exact same time, uh, Linda McMahon still hadn't paid back the $1 million that she owed her creditors from a bankruptcy 36 years ago, that uh, she owed $28,000 on property taxes on her home in Stanford. Here's what I hear when I'm talking to people out in the state. They don't want this race to be about allegations about personal finances or attack ads on the air about this subject. They want this race to be about them. They want to know which one of us is going to fight hard for their job. They want to know which one of us is going to stop the outsourcing of work from Connecticut factories. They want to know how are we going to fix the schools of this state. They want this race ultimately to be about them. Uh, that's going to be my focus over the course of the last four weeks of this race, talking about the issues that really matter to the people of the state. Mr. Murphy, thank you. Mrs. McMahon, you have 90 seconds. Well, Congressman Murphy, uh, I agree that we need to talk about the issues in this state. And 
you know, a, an occasional financial slip is really not what we're talking about here. But you absolutely need to be honest with the people of Connecticut. You need to be honest about your special interest loan. You need to be honest about your attendance in Washington. Those are issues that are important to the folks of Connecticut because they want to know, can they trust the congressman that they are sending or the senator that they're sending to Washington to represent them and to work and fight for them? I've had a career of creating jobs and contributing here to the economy of Connecticut. And I have a plan to do that. In this race, you really have no plan. My plan starts with a tax cut for the middle class. It reduces taxes on businesses. It rolls back overburdensome regulations. It cuts spending one penny out of every dollar. It focuses on education to make sure that we are educating and empowering our workforce for the jobs that are available. And lastly, it develops a comprehensive energy plan so that we'll put people back to work while we're protecting our economy and being energy independent. I've spent time developing my plan. You have no plan. And I think the people of Connecticut want to know what we're going to do for them. Thank you, Mr. McMahon. Mr. Murphy, you have 30 seconds to rebut. Well, Linda McMahon should stop spreading this fiction that I have no plan to create jobs. I know that she made her living uh, making up stories in the wrestling ring, but uh, it's not okay to make them up when you're running for the United States Senate. Uh, my plan to create jobs in the state is rooted in the work that I've done in public service, and that's based in focusing tax cuts on the middle class, not as Linda McMahon does, by focusing tax cuts on the affluent and the rich. My focus is on rebuilding our educational system, not divesting from funding in our most important services as a state. There are big differences between our plans, and that's what we should be talking about. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Our next question from Mark Pazniokas to Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon, is the public being well served by the quality and the nature of this campaign? Um, yes, we're here today uh, in a formal debate, and you two are going to probably answer somewhere around a dozen questions. But both of you have failed a basic standard of transparency and access in this campaign. Um, press conferences are few and far between, if at all. Um, neither one of you performs the basic task of letting us know where you are from day to day so we can simply listen to what you're telling voters. This is pretty basic stuff. So is the modern campaign, your campaign, serving the voters of Connecticut? I'm very pleased with the campaign that we are running. You know, I am out every single day. I have traveled our state. I've visited almost 200, over 250 businesses. I've been in over 150 living rooms around the state. So I like the effectiveness of the campaign when we can bring our message directly to the people of Connecticut. I like the folks in Connecticut to be able to look me in the eye, to ask me the questions that they want to ask me. I learn from them. I listen to them when I'm out. And I think our campaign is being run very effectively by our messaging and, our, and with our interaction with the voters. You know, it's really the voters in Connecticut who are going to make the choice, the voters in Connecticut who are going to decide whether or not the person that's going to Washington is actually going to fight for them, actually has a plan to address the most serious issue today, which is facing our country, and that is jobs in the economy. Congressman Murphy doesn't have a plan. He hasn't put a plan forth to address these issues. Folks can look online at lindasplan.com. They can see exactly what I plan to do. They know that I have a track record of creating jobs, of adding to the economy, and they know that I'm going to take that skill set to Washington in a Congress where we have so few business people who come from the private sector. Well, Thanks. Why can't the press come along for the ride, Mrs. McMahon, and monitor this? The press often does come along for the ride, and I enjoy interacting with the press. Mark, you and I have had a nice time on the trail together sometimes. Mr. Murphy, you have 90 seconds. Well, listen, this, this campaign really is about the people of the state of Connecticut. I um, ran into a guy when I was at the Hebron Fair just a couple of weeks ago uh, by the name of Adam Foote, and Adam's an out-of-work painter, and he wants to know the differences between Linda McMahon and I in terms of how we're going to put him back on the job, and there are big differences. Um, Linda McMahon's economic plan is focused on giving herself a $7 million tax cut and just kind of hoping that eventually that, that money trickles down to people that need help. My plan is focused on investing in the people of this state, making sure that we're funding our schools, that we're building roads and bridges, that we recognize that the strength of our nation is the people who desperately want to go to work. 
Now, Linda does have a plan on her website, but as we've recently learned, a good part of that is just lifted word for word, paragraph by paragraph from right-wing Republican sites uh, in Washington. Um, it's not a plan for Connecticut. It's a plan that essentially parrots a bunch of talking points that haven't worked for this country. But Listen the same to tax question to you, Mr. Murphy. Why? Why? the lack of access as far as where the two of you are day in and day well, out. Well, I don't think there's I don't think there's any comparison in terms of access. Uh, Linda Grant has refused to meet with editorial boards. I've been very willing to do so. I can't count the number of press availabilities that I've done in a very different manner than McMahon. Um, listen, Linda McMahon doesn't want this campaign to be about issues because if it is, she loses. If it's on the differences between the two of us on tax policy or support for education or women's health care. Um, she can't win because her economic plan is rooted in Republican national talking points. My economic plan is rooted in the people of the state. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Mrs. McMahon, you have 30 seconds to rebut. Now, Dennis, I'm going to take time to respond to the very serious charge that Congressman Murphy has just leveled against me. Congressman Murphy, shame on you. You have just accused me of plagiarizing my plan. It is beneath a congressman who's sitting today in Congress or anyone who is running for the United States Senate. You know very well that my plan is my own. I have sought the uh, expert opinion of those outside to get the brightest and the best, and every word of that, every word of that plan has been cited either on the online plan or in print. You. you know, when you got, no, I'm well, going to finish. Thank you, Dennis. When you got into this race as a Democrat in the state of Connecticut, you thought this was going to be a coronation. But now you're in the serious race with a serious woman. Mrs. McMahon, I'm sorry, we have to And you have resorted now to these kinds well, of policies. No, 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 we're going to move on to the next question. Well, I think you've given her extra no, time. Here. Let, let me respond. We're going to move on to the next question with Mark Pazniokas. I'm sorry, Fran Schneider has our next question to Congressman Murphy. Um, I, in this tide of uh, rising uh, national debt, I was wondering, Mr. Murphy, about the uh, question about congressional earmarks. Do you, do you uh, support elimination of them? Uh, here's one, for example, $1.9 million for a water taxi to Pleasure Beach in Bridgeport. Well, first, let me respond to Mrs. McMahon on this last allegation. Um, there's just no doubt when you look at Linda McMahon's jobs plan that there are entire paragraphs and entire sentences that are lifted from the House Republican website, from the Cato Institute. Um, and I don't know what you call it, but all I'm saying is that this is not a plan that's rooted in what's best for the state of Connecticut. It's a plan that was essentially written by people in Washington who have ideology as their primary concern, not what's best for this state. And Linda McMahon's idea, which is that by simply giving a bunch of tax cuts to the very wealthy, it's somehow going to benefit the rest of us. Well, that's a really attractive idea to right-wing Republicans in Washington, but it just doesn't work. It's never worked. Uh, and so let's talk about the differences, and let's talk about the fact that my plan continues to be rooted in what's best for Connecticut, and Linda McMahon's plan is rooted in paragraphs and sentences that were written by somebody else for ideological reasons. Now, to your question. Uh, you to your questions about, uh, about fiscal responsibility. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we need to take a very different way of looking at how the federal government dispenses funding. And I supported a moratorium uh, on earmarks because it had gotten out of control before I got to Congress. Um, but that's just the beginning slice of a much bigger question about how we bring down the size of the federal government. I've called for a 1% reduction in overall discretionary spending. I've called for a balanced approach to deficit reduction that asks the very wealthy to pay some more Thank and you, also requests more uh, cutting in, this, in the federal government. That's the way that Thank we're you, going sir. to cut the federal deficit. Mrs. McMahon, you have 90 seconds. And I'm going to finish my response to you, Congressman Murphy. Again, shame on you. As I said, you thought this campaign was going to be a coronation uh, because you're a Democrat running in Connecticut. Now you're in a serious race with a serious woman, and you are desperate. Therefore, you raise these issues. My plan cites every word that I have used from the brightest and the best to put my plan together. You'd be better served to be putting a plan together. You need to be honest, Congressman, with the people of Connecticut. You need to be honest about your special interest loan. You need to be honest about your attendance in Washington. Shame on you for taking this direction with this campaign. It's beneath you. And, as for and this the question? people of Connecticut deserve better. I, too, in my plan, have referenced a tax cut for the middle class. My plan, if you would take a look at it, absolutely 
keeps taxes the same across the board, except that we are going to cut taxes for the middle class. My plan is the only one that has an actual middle class tax cut. Congressman Murphy has voted to raise taxes on the middle class over two times already. His actions speak louder than his words. Take a look at my plan. We'll cut taxes for the middle class. We will cut taxes for businesses. However, when we cut taxes for businesses, we'll eliminate earmarks and loopholes and special subsidies. That's how we're going to generate more revenue into the uh, economy. Thank you, Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Murphy, you have 30 seconds to rebut. Here's what the uh, director of Connecticut's Center for Economic Analysis says about Linda McMahon's plan. She said it's a recipe to balloon the federal deficit at a phenomenal rate. Quote, it looks like her items were simply picked off of a menu of politically attractive items. Well, they were because they were picked off a list of politically attractive items written by somebody else outside of this state. And you should be honest about the fact that these aren't original ideas, Mrs. McMahon. These are ideas that have been tried and failed over and over again. Cutting Mr. taxes for the wealthy Mr. and Murphy, gutting services you. for our schools, Mr. for Mr. job Murphy. training has not worked for this economy. Mr. And Murphy, it will not up. work in the future. I should point out, we will have closing arguments at the end of this, a closing statement, and you can say whatever you'd like then. We would advise you, if you could, please keep to the questions so we can keep to our, our time schedule. Our next question for Mrs. McMahon. Um, from Angela. Well, let's talk about ways to improve Social Security. For instance, should payroll taxes be raised or should more income be uh, applied to the uh, payroll, uh, to the income, uh, the payroll tax rate to improve Social Security? Well, first of all, let me address that Congressman Murphy, again, on the campaign trail, has not been honest about my position on Social Security. I have never indicated, and please pay attention and listen to this and let me be clear, I will support no budget that will reduce our benefits for Social Security or Medicare to uh, our seniors. The question really was about increasing payroll taxes to support Social Security in the future. And I'm going to get to your answer. Um, I believe that we are going to have to reform Social Security and Medicare in order that it will continue uh, to be available for generations to come, and that's what I'm going to work on doing. However, I believe we have to sit in a bipartisan way in Congress, put the issues on the table, address those things that are going to be put into place to save and preserve Social Security and Medicare for the future. And we'll do that in a bipartisan way. We'll have it scored. We'll see what the financial impacts of that are. We all agree that it cannot sustain itself the way it is moving. However, we also know that we're going to have to work together to make sure that we can devise a plan that is going to work. So I specifically, want to together, are you interested in raising the payroll tax to improve Social Security? And I'll give you another 15 seconds because of the I'm question. I'm going to sit in a bipartisan commission, in a bipartisan way, in Congress to work with fellow members to put the issues on the table which we need to address to prolong Social Security and Medicare. Thank you, Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Murphy, you have 90 seconds. That was a minute and 30 seconds of I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to do if you elect me. That's what this whole campaign has been about, about Linda McMahon not being straight with the people of Connecticut when they get looked in the eye by her as to what she's going to do on the issue of Social Security. I'm going to answer your question directly. I would. Uh, look at increasing the payroll tax, uh, the amount of income, uh, if we need to uh, increase the amount of money coming into Social Security to, pre to preserve it for future generations. But let's talk about what Linda McMahon has actually said. I don't want to put words in your mouth, Mrs. McMahon, so let's take the exact quote. When you were before a Tea Party group in which you didn't think anybody was listening, uh, this is what you said about Social Security. You said, and this is a direct quote, and I do believe that there are ways to look at it. You know what we're trying to do when we put Social Security in place. We didn't go back and review it. In other words, I believe in sunset provisions when we pass this kind of legislation so that you can take a look at it 10, 15 years down the road. This was Linda McMahon's 47% moment when she told the state that she would support the sunsetting of Social Security only when she didn't think we were watching. That would be a disaster for the people of this state, for the thousands of Connecticut seniors that rely on that paycheck coming from Social Security month after month. We can't be looking at sunsetting, which is a nice way of saying ending Social Security. We have to be strengthening it and being honest with people about how we'll do it. Mr. Murphy, thank you. Mrs. McMahon, you have 30 seconds to rebut. Well, Chris, there you go again, not being honest. If you read the rest of that quote, it would absolutely 
uh, confirm what I said at the beginning of my statement. I will support no budget, unlike you, who's already voted to take out $716 billion out of Medicare. I will vote for no budget that will reduce the benefits that our seniors are currently getting. Those are your words, Mrs. McMahon. Thank you very much. Our next question from Mark to Mr. Murphy. You both describe yourselves as pro-choice and strong supporters of women's reproductive health services. So let's talk uh, some specifics. Uh, would you oppose a Supreme Court candidate known to favor overturning Roe v. Wade? And as far as reproductive health services, would you maintain the Nixon era family planning program, Title X, which provides reproductive health care to lower income patients through Planned Parenthood and other private providers? I would. Uh, I would oppose Supreme Court justices that are going to uh, use their position to strike down Roe versus Wade, and I would absolutely maintain and fight for this country's uh, commitment to family planning. Uh, I'm here with my wife, Kathy, today, and the issue of standing up for women's reproductive health care isn't just a political issue for us, it's a personal issue. My wife, for a long time, was the board chair of Connecticut NARAL, and I went to the state legislature to fight on behalf of this uh, issue, defeating one of the leading anti-choice legislators there. Uh, Linda McMahon's history here is very different. Uh, she has said on record that she would support something called the Blunt Amendment, which is a right-wing Republican proposal that will allow any employer in this country to deny their employees, their female employees, coverage for contraception, not just religious employers, religious and non-religious employers. Um, it's unconscionable that a Connecticut senator would go to Washington to stand up for that kind of right-wing proposal that could end up denying contraception coverage to millions of women across this country. And maybe even more importantly, um, I'm going to make this commitment. I will never support a leader of my party in the United States Senate that will work to overturn Roe versus Wade. If Linda McMahon is elected to the Senate and Republicans take over control of that body, no matter what her individual position is on the issue of women's choice, she will be empowering a Senate Majority Leader and a Chairman of the Judiciary Committee who will stop at nothing to erode women's health care. That's a big issue in this campaign. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Mrs. McMahon, you have 90 seconds. Well, it's a myth to think that I would be against women's health issues. I mean, Congressman Murphy, I am a woman. Clearly, I am going to continue to support access to contraception, mammograms, pap smears, all of those, as I did as the CEO of a company that actually provided all of those health benefits to its employees. Uh, I absolutely will not do anything that is going to impact women's health care issues. And relative to a Supreme Court justice, I would hope there wouldn't be a litmus test from President Romney when he is supporting, uh, when he is presenting his candidates for the Supreme Court. Supreme Court justices uh, decide many issues in many cases, and while I might not agree with them on each and every one, I would want to vet that Supreme Court justice and judge uh, the best uh, justice for all of their beliefs and all of their rulings and so that they would rule in accordance with the Constitution. Uh, the Blunt Amendment reached, overreached. It was not about contraception. It was about overreach of government and the separation of church and state. And I will always support clearly the separation of church and state and the overreach of government. Part of what's wrong in Washington today is that our government is too big. It keeps reaching into our lives. And I clearly, clearly support women's health issues, but I don't support government overreach. Mr. Murphy, you have 30 seconds to rebut. Well, here in Connecticut, we have a law in the books that says that a employer has to cover basic preventative health care, which includes coverage for contraception. The Blunt Amendment would take direct aim at states like Connecticut who have stood up for women's health care. And it's frankly, I think, insulting for Linda McMahon to say to women of this state that you should only look at her, gen her, her gender, not what she stands for. She can't run away from the fact that she would, re she would vote for the Blunt Amendment, which would end coverage for birth control Mr. for Murphy, thousands of Connecticut and millions Mr. of Murphy, women you. in this country. Our next question from Fran Schneido to Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon, now right now in Connecticut, we have 9.1% unemployment. Companies are laying off and gas prices are rising well above four bucks now. Home values are down. How has this recession affected you? Well, I think the recession has impacted so many of our people in Connecticut. You know, 171,000 people woke up this morning in Connecticut without a job. 
And the reason that I have turned my focus so strongly about creating jobs and putting people back to work in this campaign is because that is the primary issue of this campaign. Anytime anyone is impacted by higher gas prices, higher food prices, um, just the cost of everyday living, it is squeezing our middle class, squeezing our middle class. And that's why my jobs plan and my tax provisions start with a reduction on taxes to the middle class because those are the ones that we need to give a lift. We need to <clears throat> have a tax cut for our job creators so that our small businesses can continue to create jobs. We can start to turn this economy around and put our people in our state back to work because that's what will solve the issues. We put more people back to work. We, they have more money in their pockets. They pay more taxes. They buy more goods and services. And as they buy more goods and services, we create and produce more goods and services. We'll bring down the cost of our fuel and our energy and our gas prices by my energy policy. Well, we'll be energy independent. You know, our restaurants have to pay more for food when they get uh, deliveries. We have to bring down these costs and make our small businesses viable. Mr. Murphy, you have Here's how this recession has affected me. I fought even harder for the people that I represent. I've committed my life to public service because I saw my neighbors out of work. I saw my family uh, being denied health care. And so when this recession hit, uh, I turned up the volume on fighting for Connecticut manufacturers. I founded the Buy America Caucus, which is dedicated to making sure that our taxpayer dollars, when they get sent to Washington, stay here in the United States. Uh, I stepped up the volume when it came to making sure that the social safety net was there for the people of the state who are out of work, whether it be unemployment benefits or health care for them and their kids. Um, I fought even harder in the public arena for people that needed help. Now, how did this recession affect Linda McMahon? In 2009, uh, Linda McMahon's company took $10 million in state tax credits designed to create jobs. And at the same time, she laid off 10% of her workforce and made $46 million that year. Now she says it was just a tough time, it was a bad recession. Well, all she had to do to keep those 10% of her workers on board was to just make about $8 million less that year, decide that she could get by on $38 million that year rather than $46 million, and those people could still be working. Um, this recession has made me work harder, but this recession hasn't seemed to have affected Linda McMahon. Mrs. McMahon, you have 30 seconds to rebut. Well, Congressman Murphy, you know, you say that you have worked harder for the people of Connecticut. I think you need to be honest about your attendance record uh, in Washington. You didn't attend the committee hearings that were dealing with the recession, even when you served on the powerful Financial Services Committee. You missed 80 percent of those meetings. I think that recession is a time when you need to focus and learn and understand as much as you can about what's going on, and you needed to have been at those meetings. Thank you. We have now reached about the halfway point in this debate, and we turn it now to Angela Dias for, Cong for a question for Mr. Murphy. This question is about income tax rates. Do you support raising the top income tax rate as proposed by President Obama or reducing the top rate for the highest incomes as proposed by Mitt Romney? Well, let me first very quickly respond to uh, Mrs. McMahon on I, that I think accusation. as Dennis has noted, you yeah, will have, have time at the end. Yeah. The question is really now about income tax rates for the highest incomes. I have a 97% voting attendance uh, rate in Congress, and uh, we'll be glad to talk about this issue going forward because it stands in direct contrast to Linda McMahon's voting record. Um, let's talk about this issue because you're right. This is incredibly important to the people uh, of this state, and frankly, this is what people want to hear about. Um, instead of personal attacks, they want to hear about what are we going to do and what are the differences between the two of us when it comes to fighting for families in this state. My focus is on middle class tax cuts. I think that we should reauthorize the Bush tax cuts for 98 or 99 percent of Americans and expand them for families that need some help paying for education or for child care, as I've proposed. I don't think we should extend the Bush tax cuts for the wealthiest 1% of Americans. Um, you know why I don't think that? Because we tried it. We tried massive tax cuts for the wealthy during the Bush administration, and it didn't work. There's no empirical data to show that that works. And this is about choices. The choice is this. Do you think that 
$7 million is better spent in a new tax cut above current law for Lyndon McMahon or better spent in giving an additional tax credit for child care for families here in Hartford? Do you think it's better off giving $7 million to Lyndon McMahon and a new tax cut, or do you think it's better off using that money to reduce class sizes in New Britain? I know how the people of the state answer that question. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Mrs. McMahon, you have 90 seconds. My tax plan calls for cutting taxes for the middle class. It's the only real reduction in taxes for the middle class. It also calls for keeping the other tax rates the same. So there's no benefit, no increase or decrease in any other bracket. It's strictly about the middle class because that's where we need help. We need also to reduce our taxes on businesses. But you know, when I look at, at what our tax policy needs to be, we want to make sure that while we are reducing taxes, we're also reducing spending. The reason tax cuts don't always work is if you don't decrease spending at the same time. So my plan calls for a 1% uh, reduction in spending. We're on pace to spend $3.8 trillion this year. $38 billion is 1%. We have overlapping and duplicative programs uh, that cost us over $200 billion a year. I'm not talking about cutting back services. I'm talking about cutting our spending. If we were to put the tax plan in place that uh, Congressman Murphy's just talked about, we would have enough money to run the federal government for 26 days. That's not going to get the job done. That's not going to put our people back to work. That doesn't cut down on the size of government. That doesn't improve the lot of the 170,000 people who woke up in our state without a job. We need a comprehensive jobs plan to get our economy back on track. I have one. Congressman Murphy doesn't. Thank you, Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. Uh, Mr. Murphy, you have 30 seconds to rebut. This is why we're in the problem we're in today, is because uh, candidates like Linda McMahon have just promised everybody in the world that we're going to have massive tax cuts, and we're only going to cut spending by a little bit. Arithmetic has to matter at some point, as Bill Clinton said at the Democratic Convention. Here's the arithmetic on Linda McMahon's plan. She would cut taxes by $4.1 trillion, and she would cut spending by $360 billion. She'd cut taxes by 12 times the rate she would cut spending. That's why the University of Connecticut says it's a recipe for disaster on the deficit. Mr. Murphy, thank you. Our next question from Mark to Mrs. McMahon. Your campaigns talk a great deal about tax cuts, middle class tax cuts, not so much about poverty or issues of economic inequality. Uh, Connecticut obviously is a very wealthy state, but our state capital of, of Hartford, a recent report uh, noted, uh, half of all children there live in poverty. Bridgeport, New Haven, Waterbury, they're, they're not that far behind. What is your campaign doing to address poverty issues? For, are there any federal poverty programs that you can tell us here today that are absolutely off limits from budget cuts? Well, I absolutely believe that we have to have a safety net in place to take care of those people who cannot take care of themselves. They didn't opt to be in that situation. Many of them are struggling. We're a benevolent nation. We want to take care of those who cannot take care of themselves. However, I think the best way out of poverty is to have a job. And I want to make sure that we give people opportunities to have jobs and to work. Because when they then can go to work, they are also paying into the economy. They are helping the economy grow. When Congressman Murphy talks about a tax plan uh, that doesn't make mathematical sense, he's looking at America in the, in the most dismal of ways. He's not looking at an America that can grow and have economic growth because we have a growth plan in place that's going to make our economy better. So those people who are suffering, who are in poverty, who are below the poverty line, we need to continue to take care of them. Uh, as, as I drew the, uh, the, the difference between uh, President Rom Governor Romney and myself, when he talked about those in poverty, I said, they haven't chosen to be there. I wouldn't cut our food stamp programs now because we need to make sure that those folks can continue to be taken care of. But let's get them a job. Let's get them back to work so families then can progress. Thank you, Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Murphy, you have 90 seconds. Again, it's just about numbers. I mean, if you accept Linda McMahon's tax cut number, the only way to spend the only way to account for it is to have massive cuts to these programs that do put people to work, that grow jobs, and that take care of people when they're out of work. Um, 
Listen, you just have to look at the work that I've done. I've committed my life to standing up for the most vulnerable amongst us. And you know what? Some of the work that I do on these issues maybe don't get the big headlines. Um, for instance, uh, I wrote a piece of legislation, the Frank Melville Supportive Housing Investment Act, named after a great advocate for anti-homelessness here in Connecticut, that would triple the number of housing units that are built for the most vulnerable amongst us, people that have uh, very grave mental illness and physical handicaps that uh, can live on their own if they just have some supportive housing wrapped around them. I brought uh, millions of new dollars back to the state to take homeless veterans off the street. Um, when I was sworn into office, there were about a thousand homeless veterans living on the streets of Connecticut. We tripled the number of units that we've uh, paid for across this state to bring those veterans out of the woods in Waterbury, uh, from under the bridges uh, in Stanford, and put them in housing again. Um, you don't have to look to my campaign website to see if I care about the most vulnerable amongst us. You just have to look to the work that I've done. I've Mr. dedicated my life to the people of the state and the people that need help, and that will absolutely be a priority if I'm elected to the United States Senate. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Mrs. McMahon, you have 30 seconds to rebut. It is, it is imperative uh, that we continue the social programs to take care of those who cannot take care of themselves. But I want to make sure uh, that when I'm in the Senate, I am pushing forth my jobs plan to get our people back to work and grow our economy. Because when we grow our economy, everyone will benefit. We have a healthier nation and a stronger nation. And that's what I would propose to do in Washington. Thank you. Our next question from Fran Schneido to Mr. Murphy. Just to be clear, Mr. Murphy, I was just wondering, uh, the Democrats in general, of course, say we don't have to cut programs like Social Security and Medicare to tackle the national debt. And the Republicans in general are saying, oh, we just don't, we don't. Uh, need to raise taxes, but um, what do you think about that, Mr. Murphy? What programs and how would you go uh, about cutting it, and would you? Well, again, I've called for a 1% cut uh, in discretionary spending, and I have been specific about where we can do that. I've opposed duplicative programs in the Department of Defense that would build engine programs that we don't need, costing the government $3 billion. Uh, I've opposed uh, subsidies for agribusinesses in the Midwest that costs uh, this government uh, over $8 uh, billion a year that we don't need. I've opposed giving away uh, tax breaks to the oil industry and the gas industry to outsourcers uh, that they simply don't need. Uh, so I've been very willing to stand up and oppose wasteful spending. But I do believe that we need a combination of both additional revenue into the federal government from those who have done very well by this economy and some serious, some serious spending cuts. Uh, and I think that in the spirit of the senator that we're both seeking to replace, we should be electing someone to the United States Senate who's going to be willing to compromise. Um, I am. Uh, Linda McMahon is not. Linda McMahon is one of these candidates that's signed this pledge to Grover Norquist and a lobbying group in Washington. Uh, and in her debates with Chris Shays, she said that she agreed with Mitt Romney that if she was given a chance to cut spending by $10 and increase revenue by $1, that she wouldn't take it. We don't need to send somebody to Washington that's going to continue to feed this obstructionism, that's going to draw these sort of ridiculously hard lines in the sand. We need somebody who's going to go and be where the American public is, which is a compromise solution that draws from both sides of the ledger. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Mrs. McMahon, you have 90 seconds. Uh, you know, as a CEO, I always I had to bring people to the table to get a deal done. And that's how you negotiate. That's how you have compromise. You put the issues on the table. Everybody debates hard for what they want. But in the end, you walk away from the table with both sides getting some of what they wanted, but not all of what they wanted. Congressman Murphy, you and I agree on a 1% cut. Uh, in spending, except that I wouldn't cut more from defense. We've already had a half a trillion dollars cut out of the de defense budget. And if sequestration, which you are going to allow, progress, we'll have another half trillion dollars come out of our defense budget. The defense industry is very big in Connecticut with our submarine base, electric boat, all of the small industries that do subcontract work in our defense industry, it's about $3 billion. Uh, to, for the state of Connecticut. So I am not going to vote for any more cuts in our defense spending because I think we need to have a strong defense and we need to preserve that portion of the economy here in the state of Connecticut. 
I do think that there are other places to find that 1% cut. You and I agree on duplicative programs. That's clearly something that we can take away without cutting services. But let's not forget, my plan is a growth plan. When put in place, our economy will grow, our revenue will increase, because that's the way America is. Mrs. McMahon, thank you. Mr. Murphy, you have 30 seconds to rebut. Well, another 90 seconds and no answers. Not a single specific cut that Linda McMahon would support. And another example of fealty to a supply-side trickle-down economics that just hasn't worked. Give more tax cuts for the wealthy, and trust me, they will eventually trickle down to everybody else. Um, we don't need people who are going to Washington without specific ideas on where they cut, without any answers as to how they're going to actually achieve compromise. It's one thing to just say, I'm going to have everybody sit down at a table. It's another thing to actually talk about how you're going to do it. That's a big difference in this race. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Our next question to Mrs. McMahon from Angela Dias. If Obamacare is repealed, what would your plan be to ensure the millions of Americans who would be left without health insurance as a result? I want to make sure that, <clears throat> and, and excuse me, I, I am on record of saying that I would repeal and replace uh, Obamacare. There are parts of Obamacare that I think are very good. I think the fact that uh, a child today, especially in today's economy, that can stay on their parents' insurance until they're 26 is a very good thing. Uh, I think that we, we need to make sure, though, that when we're not being penalized for uh, pre-existing conditions, that's a very good thing in Obamacare. However. I think Obamacare was put into place to bring down the cost curve on health care, and that's not what's happening. Insurance premiums are going up. The cost of health care is going up. And we're going to add about 10 million more people to our health care rolls, and we're not going to have the doctors or the medical personnel to support that. So I do think that we need a health care revision. There's no question about that. But we need health care revision that's going to allow the marketplace also to compete to bring down those costs. We need to be able to buy insurance across state lines. That means that states have to get out of the business of mandates for insurance. We need tort reform to bring down the cost of insurance. We need accessibility for insurance. We need affordability for insurance. This current law is not going to do that. It will continue to drive up health care costs and the cost of insurance premiums. Mr. Murphy, you have 90 seconds. Let me tell you why I've dedicated my life to the idea that everyone in this country should have access to decent health care. Um, it's a woman in Meriden, Connecticut by the name of Betty Berger. And, uh, Betty's worked hard all her life, so has her husband. And her husband was switching jobs. And in between those two jobs, during the week or so that he was unemployed, their son was diagnosed with cancer. And when they went to get insurance for him on her husband's new plan, they wouldn't provide for it because he had a pre-existing condition one week or two weeks over their lifetime when they didn't have insurance. And you know what happened to the burgers? They lost everything. They lost their house. They lost their savings. They became destitute simply because an illness happened at the wrong time. There is no repeal and replace plan. The Republicans in Washington have voted to repeal this bill 33 times, and they've never offered any replacement. We need to protect this bill and perfect it going forward because it matters for the burgers. It matters for small businesses that are going to get tax cuts from this bill. It matters for all of those individuals out there who have been discriminated against because they are sick, have gone bankrupt because someone in their family uh, got ill, uh, that uh, couldn't get health care simply because they didn't have the money to afford it. Let's fix this bill and make it right. Let's not repeal it. And the mythology that you can just preserve all the good parts well, getting rid of all the parts that you don't like, um, that can't happen. And it's not what the Republican Mr. Party that Linda Mr. McMahon Murphy, wants to empower is planning on doing. Mr. Murphy, thank you. Mrs. McMahon, you have 30 seconds to rebut. I would vote to repeal and replace because this health care bill was passed under the framework of a government takeover of health care. And I don't agree with that. I don't think that would be the most efficient way for us to offer health care to, to our citizens. You know, and within this bill, there are 21 tax increases Congressman Murphy, you referenced that you that you would be cutting taxes for our small businesses under uh, under this plan, but it doesn't. It raises taxes, and small businesses tell me it is their single largest concern. Mrs. McMahon, thank you. Our next question is from Mark to Mr. Murphy. Regardless of what happens with the Affordable Care Act, government will remain deeply involved in health care. Uh, who gets covered? 
Medicaid, Medicare. I want to ask about a very sensitive part of health cost containment. One third of U.S. health spending is to take care of Americans in their last year of life. Does that need to change? And how does government tackle something like that without the debate quickly turning into talk of government death panels and uh, health care rationing? Well, we need to make a commitment to people who are on public health care systems like Medicare and Medicaid that we're going to take care of them throughout their life uh, and that we will take care of them compassionately at the end of life. Uh, that's my commitment as a United States Senator. But in order to do that, you have to have a Medicare and a Medicaid program that works for those individuals and that isn't just designed to pad the bottom lines of insurance companies. Um, uh, this is where Linda McMahon and I differ. Um, I believe that we have to make changes to Medicare in order to save that program. Uh, we have to make it more efficient. We have to make it more cost effective. We have to get the waste out of it. We don't need to privatize it. Uh, Lynn McMahon has said that she would uh, entertain Paul Ryan's plan to privatize Medicare, that she'd take a look at it if she was a senator. I won't. I'll fight the privatization of Medicare with every breath that I have because, to your question, Mark, if Medicare becomes privatized, if Medicaid becomes privatized, and it's just being run by a bunch of healthcare insurance companies, then the decisions that are made will be what's best in their interests, what uh, makes their bottom line better, not what protects Connecticut seniors, not what protects those families that are trying to come to a very tough decision government as to what happens at the end, in at the end, end of, of life. Care end of life health care and the spending that goes with that. I'll give you an additional 15 seconds. Because of sure, and, and the way to do this is just simply not to empower a bunch of health insurance bureaucrats. The way to do this is to have families um, deep in consultation with physicians about what the best course of action is by their direction and by their choice at the end of life. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Mrs. McGann, you have 90 seconds. Congressman Murphy and I agree that the choice between late-term care or any care ought to be between families and physicians. Unfortunately, the Affordable Health Care Act takes that away. It puts panels in between the patient and the doctor. That is something that I do not agree with in our health care law. That's one of the reasons that I oppose it. You know, these are times that we have to look at what is best you know, for everyone to have the best kind of health care they can have. I believe in preventative health care. And I certainly, let me just address one thing I, I, before I, let me digress for a second. I have never said that I am for privatizing Social Security or our Medicare plans. That's clearly not my stance, and Congressman Murphy knows that, and he has to be honest about that. I will support continuing reform to Social Security and our Medicare so that we prolong it for our generations. Congressman Murphy voted to take $716 billion out of Medicare to fund the Affordable Health Care Act. I don't think that's what we should do. We are therefore then going to eventually deny perhaps that, that those services to our seniors from our hospitals or our doctors who aren't going to take Medicare patients any longer. These are some of the downfalls, the pitfalls that are in the Affordable Health Care Act. These are the things that I want to adjust and take care of so that we don't penalize our seniors. Thank you, Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Murphy, you have 30 seconds to rebut. Well, President Obama let Mitt Romney get away with this $700 billion lie, and I'm not going to let Lyndon McMahon get away with it. Uh, that money was taken uh, out of the budgets of health insurers who were being massively subsidized for providing Medicare Advantage. It was being taken out of the pockets of drug industries who, and drug companies who were making billions off of care for our seniors. Um, if you're going to be serious about reducing the rate of growth of Medicare, which you have to be, then you have to be willing to say that we're going to end the subsidies to insurance companies and drug companies who don't need our money when seniors do. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Our next question from Fran Schneido to Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon, um, in North Carolina, your home state, uh, man, uh, gay marriage is uh, banned. And here in Connecticut, gay marriage is legal. Which state got it right? Well, I live in Connecticut, and I absolutely support uh, America's law uh, for, uh, you know, same-sex marriage. And uh, I, I wouldn't pretend to, to try to impose my will or rights on others. I think everyone should have, you know, the freedom to make that choice. Mr. Murphy? Well, uh, America doesn't have a law protecting same-sex marriage. In fact, it has the exact opposite. The United States has a law that doesn't allow 
people to marry based on their choice that discriminates against individuals based on their sexual orientation. And, you know, I think the fact that Linda McMahon spent only about 20 seconds answering that question tells you that she's not going to stand up to her party in Washington when it comes to uh, these issues that are right now being dominated by the social right in Washington. There is a war being waged against gays and lesbians, and I've been proud to stand on one side of that war. I was proud to stand up to end the don't ask, don't tell policy that discriminates against brave men and women in our military. And I'm proud to stand for the idea that anyone in this country, regardless of their sexual orientation, should be treated uh, the same. Um, that's going to be the fight that I continue. But the shortness of that answer suggests that Linda McMahon is not going to stand up to the social right in her party, which is both trying to destroy the rights of gays and lesbians, but is also uh, trying to destroy the rights of women in this country, trying to take away their ability to choose for themselves what they want to do with their body, trying to uh, end coverage for family planning services uh, and uh, for reproductive health care services. Um, I'm going to fight that social right, whether it's on gay rights or the issue of women's rights. Um, every Every day that I'm in the United States Senate, Linda McMahon, as a Republican in the Senate, is simply going to be another vote to empower it. Um, that's a critical difference. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Mrs. McMahon, you have 30 seconds to respond. Mr. Murphy, you voted with your party 98% of the time. I'm an independent thinker. I will differ from my party on particular issues. Uh, and, and clearly... On that one? Uh, I will clearly on the issue differ of, from on my... On the issue of I will, civil rights? I will absolutely differ from my party. I am... Uh, certainly a pro-choice candidate. I believe in equal rights for all, like you. If I'd been voting, I would have voted to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I don't think we should have discrimination in our military, in our workplace, or anywhere. Ms. We all have our rights. Mrs. McMahon, thank you. Our next question from Angela Dias to Mr. Murphy. Knowing that many voters form their opinions based on political ads, how can you justify airing ads that in some cases have been determined by fact checker checkers to be misleading, confusing, and downright inaccurate? Well, the ads that you see on TV from, re from me right now are me in my kitchen talking to voters directly, talking to them about the differences between me and Linda McMahon on critical issues. Uh, I support a middle class tax cut. Linda McMahon supports cutting taxes for the very wealthy, including giving herself a $7 million tax cut. My history is of standing up for the people of this state, whether it's taking homeless veterans off the street and giving them housing, or whether it's about fighting for the most vulnerable who need a roof over their head because of a disability or a mental illness. Um, Linda McMahon has used her job in a very different way, going to Washington to fight to lower protections for her workers, uh, for the people that relied on her. Um, those are the issues that we should be talking about in this campaign, the differences between me and Linda McMahon on the issues that we stand for and on our respective professional histories. What I don't think voters want is, are these personal attacks that Linda McMahon is waging against me and my wife and my family. It's not surprising that she's doing it. She tried to do it two years ago. She tried to destroy Dick Blumenthal's reputation with a series of very personal attacks at his integrity and his reputation. But people in this state want this race to be focused on issues. And to the extent that I'm talking about Linda McMahon in my ads, I'm talking about the differences between her and I and the issues that matter to Connecticut families. Uh, I hope that that's going to be the focus of this race for the final four weeks. Mr. Murphy, thank you. Mrs. McMahon, you have 90 seconds. <laughs> Chris, you must not have been watching all your own ads. Uh, at any rate, I do think that we clearly ought to be discussing the issues. That's why I have an ad that talks about my six-point plan. It lays it out. It talks about tax cuts for the middle class. It talks about reducing taxes for businesses. It talks about rolling back over burdensome regulations. You know, when I've been up uh, touring our businesses in Connecticut, there was a fellow named Dave Fallon uh, that was up in Plainfield, Connecticut. And he told me that he was dealing with overregulation relative to the bank. He wanted to double the size of his facility, put in two new pieces of equipment, hire eight new employees. So he goes to his bank he'd done business with for years, and under the current regulatory environment, his bank took a look at his business plan. He says, hey, Dave, here's your problem. He said, you're asset rich and cash poor. He said, I know that. If I had the cash, I wouldn't be here for a loan. And he would have had to have over-collateralized that loan by 150% under the current regulatory environment. I want Dave to be able to grow his business. It's a, it's a classic example of regulation killing jobs. 
we need to make sure we have the proper amount of regulation, but not over-regulation. My plans also, my commercials also talk about reducing spending, uh, empowering our workforce for training for jobs that are available, and also developing a comprehensive energy policy to put our people back to work, be energy independent, and protect our environment. Mr. Murphy, 30 seconds to rebut. Linda, you've been running some of the most deceitful, personal attack ads this state has ever seen. Don't try to pretend that that's not what's been happening in this race. When your campaign was asked, why don't you start talking about the issues, your campaign manager said, well, because that would be a senseless exercise. Well, that's right. For Linda McMahon, talking about the issues would be a senseless exercise. The only way that she can win is by running these personal attack ads against me and my family. My path is different. My path is running a race based on the differences between the two of us on the issues. And that's what, for me, the final four weeks of this campaign will be about. Very good. All right. Thank you very much. It's time now for our closing statements, and we begin with Mrs. McMahon. Well, I want, again, I want to once again thank you all for joining us uh, this morning. Clearly, the voters in Connecticut are going to have a clear choice come November. They'll have a clear choice between a job creator who has a plan to create millions of jobs and someone who has never created a job and doesn't have a plan to do that. Someone who will raise taxes on the middle class, because he's voted to do that already, and someone who is going to reduce taxes on the middle class. Someone who desperately wants to put our folks back to work. Someone who wants to give an honest representation to the people of Connecticut. Uh, and I think Congressman Murphy does need to be honest. He needs to be honest about his special interest and his special interest loan. You know, I don't have that opportunity to have special interest loan, and I wouldn't take it. I wouldn't take special interest money because I can't be bought. Congressman Murphy needs to come clean. I would be honored to serve as your United States Senator, and I'll ask for your vote on November 6th. Thank you, Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Murphy, you have one minute. Well, thank you very much, Dennis, and to all of our panelists and to our studio audience. You know, I may not be worth millions like Linda McMahon, but that's because I've dedicated my life to fighting for the people of this state. Now, uh, Linda McMahon is going to use her wealth, as you've seen here today, to spend the last few weeks of this race engaged in very personal attacks against me and my family and my wife. And here's my message to the people of this Connecticut, the people of Connecticut. Don't let her do it. Make this race be about you. Make it be about the senior citizen who can't have their next senator play games with their paycheck. Make it be about the out-of-work factory worker who wants a senator who's going to fight for insourcing, not outsourcing. Make it be about the little kid in New Britain who can't learn with 30 kids in their class. Make this race be about you. Set aside the personal attacks and the lies that you see on TV and focus this race on which one of the two of us is going to put you back to work and support the middle class. Thank you very much.